Thank you. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Um, and welcome to our first uh, design at large uh, talk for spring 2021 quarter. We're really excited um, today. We have, I mean, obviously we have a lineup of wonderful speakers, um, but before we kind of jump in, um, I just, you know, I hope everybody is doing kind of as well as can be expected. I think it's been a really intense week um, with the Chauvin trial and the continued racial violence in the country. And I just kind of want, want to acknowledge that we're doing this with that in, in the context and the backdrop of everything that, that's happening. Um, so today um, we have uh, Dr. Vanessa Farrell here. We are so lucky to have uh, Dr. Farrell with us. Uh, they're a graduate of the UC San Diego School of Medicine and Columbia, Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, uh, who is passionate about employing health equity, social medicine, and anti-racism as practices to achieve liberation for marginalized and oppressed people. Dr. Farrell seeks to apply an anti-racist health equity and intersectional justice lens to all aspects of medicine and healthcare. Dr. Farrell has created medical ed education curricula based in structural competency, intersectionality, and critical race theory, such as intersections of LGBTQ health at UCSD and social med medicine immersion month at Montefiore. As a leftist and abolitionist, Dr. Farrell is dedicated to decrying structural oppression, supporting radical community organizing, and imagining a world without harm. Dr. Farrell can be found on Twitter frequently at um, their handle, Vanessa Farrell. Uh, Dr. Farrell, I will now turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna- Real quick is, um, I'm gonna quickly do the mute all, and then uh, you'll have to unmute yourself again. So, all right. Excellent. I'm going to pull up my screen. All right. Presumably, y'all can see this. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you for joining. Um, just sending love and solidarity to everyone who's feeling the heaviness of white supremacy alongside the grief and loss of a pandemic um, in these times. Um, medicine is a microcosm of society. Structures of oppression in society are invariably replicated in medicine and healthcare. Kiriarchy, as defined by Elizabeth Fiorenza, is a social system or set of connecting social systems built around domination, oppression, and submission. Kiriarchy expands beyond cis-heteropatriarchy to include racism, capitalism, ableism, Islamophobia, et cetera. The framework of intersectionality defined by Kimberly Crenshaw informs us that these systems of oppression are interconnected and overlapping. People at the intersections of multiple marginalized identities are most often subjected to the worst health outcomes but this is not a problem unique to medicine or healthcare. Despite the heaviness of racism and capitalism, folks at these intersections are still able to support and uplift each other, even through pandemic times. That kind of community self-determination is what we need to be supporting and uplifting in order to be accomplices in the fight for health equity and liberation for all people. Um, so this is me. I'm Vanessa. I am a uh, Bronx-based doctor finishing my training at Montefiore's primary care social internal medicine training program. I currently live and work in the Bronx. Um, I graduated from UC San Diego School of Medicine and Columbia University uh, School of Public Health. <laughs> my interests are abolition of prisons, police, and detention, Black liberation, community organizing, health equity, public health, and HIV. Um, you can find me on Twitter at my name, and please feel free to engage with this presentation in real time and send me any commentary afterwards. We'll start with our task for today. Um, so we're going to explore the foundation of race as a social construct. We'll discuss inequities in health outcomes and medical education. We'll apply principles of justice, abolition, liberation to healthcare, and we will collectively design a more inclusive, equitable healthcare environment. So we'll start by exploring sociological frameworks of race and racism. As gender and race scholar and University of Pennsylvania law professor Dorothy Roberts says, 
Race is a social category that has staggering biological consequences because of the impact of social inequality on people's health. Fundamentally, race is a social political construct, not a biologic or genetic one. And race exists because of racism. Despite the best efforts of social scientists and critical race theorists, medicine and medical research continues to consider race as a physiologic, biologic, or genetic entity. Race is used to justify morbidity and mortality for chronic disease, it's used as a way to categorize responses to pharmaceutical classes and medications, and is used as a correction factor for physiologic processes like lung and kidney function. While structural competency is increasingly incorporated into medicine and medical education, the fact remains, medicine has a historical fundamental racism problem. And this should come as no surprise. As you've likely identified by now, racism is ingrained in every single aspect of our society. Medicine is a microcosm, not an exception. Kamara Phyllis-Jones, who is a family medicine doctor, social epidemiologist, and the past president of the American Public Health Association says, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how we look, or what we call race, that unfairly advantages some individuals and communities while disadvantaging others. It saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, a prison abolitionist, prison scholar, and professor at the City University of New York says, racism is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Therefore, racism is intentional, it is celebrated, and is perpetuated by the state apparatus. Now I'll talk a little about, about uh, the history of medical racism. So this is a very brief history of medical racism and experimentation in the United States. The United States was founded on the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of African people. So a significant amount of medical racism is anti-Black and anti-Indigenous. The US, of course, has committed far more atrocities than we have time for today. In the 1840s, three enslaved Black women named Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy were among those subjected to numerous surgical gynecologic procedures by J. Marion Sims, a physician who fundamentally believed that Black people don't feel pain. Sims was lauded for over a century as a so-called father of gynecology. Samuel Cartwright in the 1850s argued that enslavement was medically beneficial for Black people. He developed the spirometer, a tool to measure lung volumes, with the claim that Black people have lower lung volumes, therefore forced labor is good for them. This race correction continues to be used in spirometry today. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment began in the 1930s, enrolling about 600 Black men under the guise of providing free medical care. Despite penicillin being becoming the standard of treatment about 15 years into the study, the US Public Health Service opted to observe the disease's full progression and offered placebos rather than treatment. In the early 1930s, the United States, on the basis of eugenics, heavily lobbied sterilization via tubal ligation in Puerto Rico. Medical staff infrequently informed patients of the permanent nature of the surgical procedure. Decades later, extremely high doses of oral contraceptive pills were tested for safety in PR without any kind of informed consent. In the mid-1940s, the US funded a study that involved deliberately infecting over 1,500 Guatemalans with syphilis and other STIs. This was all under the guise of determining the effectiveness of penicillin as a treatment. In the 1950s, scientists at Johns Hopkins biopsied tumor cervical cells from Henrietta Lacks and created an immortalized cell line called the HeLa cell line without her consent, her knowledge, or any compensation to her or her family. In the 1960s, Fannie Lou Hamer was one of hundreds of thousands of Black people in the South who underwent involuntary, uninformed, compulsory hysterectomy. After her experience, she coined the phrase Mississippi appendectomy. In the 1960s and 1970s, over 3,000 Native Americans were forcibly sterilized, affecting at least 25% of the Native population. Between the 1990s and the mid-2010s, over 1,000 women incarcerated in California prisons were forcibly sterilized. And last year, 2020, 
Whistleblower Don Wooten decried coerced sterilizations of immigrant women being detained at the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. This history of racism, exploitation, and experimentation is not a remote or one-off occurrence. It is deeply connected to historical and ongoing health inequities. Now I'll talk a little about, about health inequities and social determinants. Historically, in the United States, the top three leading causes of death are heart disease, cancer, and accidental injury. In 2020, the top three leading causes of death were heart disease, cancer, and COVID-19. In general, men die at higher rates than women, and Black people die at higher rates than white people. Health inequities are differences in health outcomes or in the distribution of resources that arise from social condition of where a person is born, raised, lives, and ages. Health inequities don't only apply to these differences in life expectancy. They're also represented by the fact that maternal mortality for a non-Hispanic, non-Latinx Black woman is 2.5 times higher than that of non-Hispanic white women and 3.5 times higher than Latinx women. Health inequities are manifested by the increased rates of chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, and kidney disease for Black people and non-Black people of color. Health inequities are demonstrated in the higher rates of new HIV diagnosis among Black and Latinx people. Because medicine still purports race as a biologic or genetic construct rather than a social construct, these health inequities are often explained away as being due to underlying genetic vulnerabilities. This perpetuates the idea that Black people and non-Black people of color are a monolith and disregards the fact that Black people are literally everywhere across the world. Furthermore, data on health outcomes is infrequently disaggregated, assuming a categories of binary race, that is Black or white, and binary ethnicity, that is Latinx, Hispanic, or not. The reality is Black people in the US can be disaggregated into Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinx, Black Asian, Black Native, Africans, Black Americans, et cetera. Latinx folks can be any race because it's an ethnicity. A multitude of other races exist in the US, and these people are just simply not counted. I think a lot of this deficiency in data collection is intentional because it's easier to ignore what you don't have the data for. That being said, what we do know about health inequities is that racism, capitalism, classism, and other systems of oppression directly lead to poor health outcomes. This has become particularly salient in the past year as the onset of the COVID-19 crisis exposed structural oppression ingrained in the fabric of our society. For example, people of color, particularly Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people, are more likely to be frontline workers unable to work from home. Legacies of redlining and segregated housing concentrate communities of color in specific neighborhoods. Comparing neighborhood maps of communities of color with maps of COVID diagnosis rates, hospitalization rates, and mortality rates, usually pretty proportional, while the maps of COVID testing sites and vaccination sites are inversed. In a text called Freedom for Some is Not Freedom for All, Alice Wong, a disabled woman of color and disability justice advocate writes, fighting for justice and liberation requires the abolition of all systems that oppress and punish us for merely existing. And when I say racism, capitalism, classism, and other systems of oppression lead directly to poor health outcomes, what does that mean? We'll take, for example, Mott Haven. It's a neighborhood in the South Bronx that makes a part of the 15th Congressional District. It's sometimes colloquially called Asthma Alley due to the disproportionately high rates of childhood and adult asthma in the neighborhood. Mott Haven, like much of the Bronx, is a neighborhood where predominantly Latinx and Black people live. In 2018, the poverty rate in the Mott Haven Melrose District was 37.7% compared to 17.3% across New York City. 23% of rental units compared to the 8.1% citywide are owned and operated by the New York City Housing Authority, which is the nation's largest, largest public health authority, largest public housing authority, and is recognized last year as the worst landlord in New York City. So I wanna be clear that this distribution of poverty does not represent individual failures. It is an indictment of a racist capitalist system and is the result of historical and intentional disinvestment. Asthma Alley is not an accident. It exists because of historical disinvestment and racism in urban planning. 
This is a map of the South Bronx and Mount Haven is the neighborhood in the Southwest corner. The green line at the top represents the I-95, which connects Manhattan and New Jersey to the West and Connecticut to the Northeast. The orange line represents the I-87, I-278 that connects upstate New York to the North and Brooklyn and Queens to the South. There's an enormous amount of traffic on each path. Like y'all know traffic, y'all know traffic in Southern California, it's semi-trucks bumper to bumper. That's what this looks like. These freeways are main access routes for cargo trucks and passenger vehicles. This increases the traffic between the many industrial warehouses that line the South Bronx. This is all in close proximity to housing complexes, apartment buildings, and outdoor spaces, and dumps huge amounts of pollution into the air. On the topic of historical disinvestment, this figure is from Mapping Inequality, which is an interactive source on historical red line practices. The redlining map is of the entire Bronx, and the area examined on the previous map is indicated by the circle. Mott Haven, again, is located in the southwest corner. In the 1940s, over 80% of the Bronx was classified as grade C, that is definitely declining, or grade D, hazardous. Mott Haven was designated one of those hazardous areas. From the early 20th century, the Bronx was deemed undesirable. And as the Bronx burned in the 1970s, the Black and Latinx people were forced to rebuild without the support or investment of a government that aimed to continually fail them. So, leads to dis disproportionate exposure to fine particulate matter and ozone, which undoubtedly increases the prevalence and severity of asthma among Bronx residents in a phenomenon known as pollution inequity. Pollution inequity was defined in 2019 by Tessum et al. as the extent to which groups disproportionately contribute to or bear the burden of pollution. Aside from Mott Haven specifically, the Bronx has high rates of teenagers and adults who have ever been diagnosed with asthma. For the Bronx, pollution inequity means that on average, children and adults experience twice as many ED visits and hospitalizations attributable to these pollutants. Even outside of a pandemic, pollution inequity and environmental racism make it difficult for many of my patients in the Bronx to even breathe. Now I'll talk a little bit about hierarchy and policing in medicine. So health inequities aren't just due to structural oppression. Interpersonal or personally mediated racism, classism, ableism, and transphobia all contribute to poor health outcomes. The clinical decision-making tools we choose to use, the medications, treatments, or services we decide to offer or not offer, such as life or limb-saving treatment, the decision to use medical interpretation services, the language that we use in our clinical documentation, and the attitudes we convey with patients and their loved ones, all has an impact. I wanna highlight this 2012 report on devaluing people with disabilities. It states that clinicians often perpetuate ableism by withholding care or enforcing unnecessary procedures for disabled folks. This is very congruent with medicine's longstanding history of eugenics, and it's a practice that physicians need to reconcile in the face of COVID-19. COVID has been a mass disabling event, disproportionately increasing the number of people with new onset autonomic, neurologic, cardiac, respiratory, and renal issues. This is something that's being called long haul COVID. Even the clinical decision-making tools we choose to use can perpetuate racism. The predominant measure for kidney function has a quote unquote race, fact, race correction factor built in. It estimates kidney function based on four categories. One is a binary race, which is black or not black, and assumes that black people have higher muscle mass. The other categories are age, gender, and creatinine, which is a kidney enzyme. This race correction means that people categorized as black appear to have higher kidney function and has historically delayed referral to nephrologists and evaluation for kidney transplant. This means that people racialized as black aren't referred for life-saving organ transplantation until they are sicker than their non-black counterparts. Importantly, working with so-called vulnerable, underserved or under-resourced communities does not exempt or absolve us as healthcare workers 
from perpetuating racism, classism, or ableism. Even people who work within safety net hospitals or healthcare systems support an oppressive system. Medicine isn't just a driver and enforcer of oppression. Medical training and the practice of medicine also enforces, supports, and upholds policing. There are small acts of policing, like ordering drug screens without consent, documenting that patients advocating for themselves or their loved ones are disruptive, combative, or aggressive, and denying hospitalized patients the opportunity to leave their units or to get fresh air. There's also a larger act, many larger acts of policing, like calling the actual police or hospital security guards for the so-called combative patients, calling ACS or CPS on families who need resources instead of offering them the services and resources they need, and criminalizing poverty by suing patients over their medical bills. Additionally, healthcare within the carceral system is filled with neglect of chronic diseases and the criminalization of mental health disorders. A 2016 survey of policing in the medical environment found that in, among security personnel in hospitals, 47% had tasers, 52% had handguns, 52% had pepper spray, and 56% had batons. Pictured on the left is Alan Peen, who was 26 years old in August 2015 when he was hospitalized during a manic episode in Texas. While he was admitted for observation, he developed increased delusions over the period of hours and was not able to follow commands. Hospital security was called, although he was not being physically aggressive. The security officers were off-duty police officers who tased Allen and then shot him in the chest, just missing his heart. He was then handcuffed. Fortunately, he survived. Unfortunately, he was not the first person to be shot in a hospital, nor was he the last. I'm currently reading a collection of essays from Mariam Kaba's We Do This Till We Free Us. Mariam Kaba is a prison abolitionist and transformative justice organizer. A few of her quotes stand out to me. First, harm causes wounds that necessitate healing. Second, a system that never addresses the why behind a harm never actually contains the harm itself. Next, I'll talk a little bit about racism in medical education. In her 1979 Barnard College Commencement Address, Toni Morrison advised graduates that, quote, you are moving in the direction of freedom and the function of freedom is to free somebody else. I think this is particularly salient as Paolo Freire in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed rightfully observes that, quote, the oppressors who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that representation is an automatic gateway to liberation. In fact, as Tarmeline once said, Visibility is a driver of criminalization, not a pillar of liberation. And Angela Davis calls diversity a corporate strategy. That being said, if medicine wasn't founded on white supremacy, then perhaps the landscape of health inequities could look different. Presently, 5% of active physicians are black, 5.8% are Latinx, 0.3% are Native American, and 0.1% are Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. In the medical community, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people are deemed underrepresented in medicine due to the disproportionate lack of physicians compared to the general population. It is important to note that these so-called underrepresented minorities in medicine are underrepresented only by virtue of historical exclusion and racism. For example, the study on the right examines the impact of the Flexner Report in the early 1900s. The Flexner Report reduced the number of historically Black medical schools from 13 to 2. The author of the report, Abraham Flexner, was a non-physician educator recruited by the founding dean of Johns Hopkins to create a standardized approach to medical education. He recommended the closure of 11 historically Black medical schools, stating that Black medical trainees should be trained for the purpose of serving other Black people as quote-unquote sanitarians. In the study, 
The authors use data from existing historically black medical schools to estimate the number of physicians who could have received training from just five of the 11 schools that were closed. Under a steady expansion model, they estimate an additional 27,000 graduates could have been produced. Under a rapid expansion model, they estimate an additional 35,000 graduates. The Flexner report squandered the possibility of tens of thousands more pra practicing black doctors in the last century. However, even if tens of thousands more black doctors were advanced through medical training in the past century, who's to say they wouldn't be reviled in the same way black medical students and residents are now? Now I wanna talk about um, liber liberation movements in medicine. I'll start briefly by talking about two organizations that I look to as examples of liberatory frameworks in health and medicine. First, the Black Panther Party, a pro-Black, anti-imperialist, anti-racist, anti-police brutality, Black power organization whose work and organizing tactics take into account the social and political drivers of health and the importance of community self-determination as a path to liberation. Dr. Mary Bassett describes the Black Panthers as health activists who championed health as a human right. As part of their 10 point program pictured here, they include a point on health. We want completely free healthcare for all black and oppressed people. We believe that the government must provide free of charge for the people, health facilities, which will not only treat our illnesses, most of which have come about as a result of our oppression, but will also develop preventative medical programs to guarantee our future future survival. The Panthers began a national screening program for sickle cell, which is notoriously underfunded because of its reputation as a quote unquote black disease. They operated free medical clinics for the people by the people. Their other demands included an end to racist police violence, community control of land and housing, historically accurate and accessible education, safe and decent housing and full employment for black people. Next, the Young Lords. The Young Lords were a Puerto Rican liberation organization whose New York City chapter was founded in 1969. The Lords collaborated with the Panthers in the interest of Black and Latinx solidarity and liberation. Several of the Young Lords efforts centered on Lincoln Hospital in Mott Haven. Lincoln was the only medical facility serving the South Bronx and was referred to as the Bercher Shop due to the significant in-hospital morbidity and mortality of its patients. The Young Lords occupied Lincoln Hospital several, several times in 1970. In June 1970, a rally was held to address funding cuts in the hospital. Police targeted the Young Lords, firebombed their Bronx office, and beat up several members of the community. The following day, the Lords set their seven demands and offered tuberculosis, lead poisoning, and anemia testing to the Mount Haven community. Their seven demands included adequate staffing and services in the hospital, door-to-door -door preventative care program, a fair minimum wage, a 24-hour complaint table, daycare for children of those visiting, working, and hospitalized at Lincoln, and self-determination of all Lincoln health services. In July 1970, a 31-year-old patient named Carmen Rodriguez died after doctors gave her medications that triggered an allergic reaction during a routine abortive procedure. They had failed to read her chart and note her allergy. The Young Lords occupied part of Lincoln Hospital in response. And in November 1970, the Young Lords occupied a floor in Lincoln Hospital, demanding the implementation of an opioid program to address an ongoing heroin crisis that would serve the community effectively and be run by the community. The People's Program was established the day after the occupation began and was comprised of people who use heroin, healthcare workers, and community members. So this um, setting might look familiar, hopefully to everyone who's at UCSD, I, I assume you've probably seen this library. Um, so this is December, 2014. This is the first national white coat die-in, also known as White Coats for Black Lives. The white coat die-in was a coordinated effort that originated with Black medical students as a response to the execution of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. It was a demonstration in solidarity with Black people everywhere, and it was a profound condemnation of the medical community's silence and complicity 
in perpetuating police violence and anti-Black racism. Following this die-in, students and trainees continued to organize around White Coats for Black Lives and formally established a national organization on MLK Day 2015. Within the UCSD School of Medicine, the organizing continued under the student group Medical Students for Justice. Like many trainee-led anti-racism initiatives, medical students organizing with White Coats for Black Lives were silenced by their institutions and had their careers threatened. This was all even as names of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people killed by the state built up. Medicine, in all its racism, will always seek to defend and uphold the white supremacist status quo. Because of mine and my comrades' experiences speaking out against racism and other forms of oppression as medical students and residents, I was surprised when institutions suddenly began to decry racism and pledge anti-racism last summer. I like to call this phenomenon the acute anti-racism movement because institutions, organizations, and healthcare systems went from ignoring racism out of existence and suppressing voices that said otherwise to suddenly being very vocal and taking a stand on structural racism, anti-Blackness, and police violence. I'm sure you remember all the white font on Black backgrounds declaring a commitment to anti-racism. No brand was left unturned. And in hospitals, clinics, and healthcare systems, racism was suddenly not a dirty word anymore. And healthcare workers were falling over themselves to organize performative solidarity demonstrations in the name of White Coats for Black Lives, the same people they had been bullying and silencing for years. This co-optation did not go unnoticed by the National White Coats for Black Lives organization, who in June 2020 put out the statement that says as follows, we are a student-led organization founded in 2015 and committed to Black liberation. We take our cues from the Black radical tradition. Our vision and actions are grounded in politics of abolition, anti-capitalism, and anti-imperialism. As such, many of the rallies this past week using the White Coats for Black Lives name were not organized by our organization and are not in line with our values. In some cases, our mission has been co-opted and diluted. We urge health professionals to familiarize themselves with our mission, take action beyond performative protests, and hold our complicit health institutions accountable for police brutality and institutional racism. So now I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 and hierarchy. This is an article I published on Left Voice last spring titled Structural Violence, COVID-19, and the Bronx. Early on in the pandemic, it became abundantly clear who was dying from COVID. Black and brown folks, indigenous folks, Latinx folks. People who were in high-risk jobs as frontline workers, unable to work from home, and unable to isolate themselves from other people in their homes. Being a medical resident in the epicenter of a global pandemic was terrifying and heartbreaking. I watched patients exploited for their labor, unable to access testing before it was too late, and falling terribly ill alongside the family members they were unable to distance themselves from. Entire households were hospitalized, and people across their lifespans died in my presence. All of this while politicians across the country with a complete disregard for human life suggested that elderly, chronically ill and disabled people should be willing to die for the so-called economy. Access to testing and treatment was deprioritized once it became evident that people of color were at risk of dying. Racial capitalism and structural ableism were in full effect. And in the year that followed, the US government and society showed black people and non-black people of color and disabled people and chronically ill people and those at the intersections of marginalized and minoritized identities that we are disposable. And then suddenly and seemingly overnight, the social messaging changed courses completely. Black and indigenous people of color were suddenly thought of as priority groups for a novel vaccine heavily advertised by Big Pharma. These conversations about vaccine hesitancy and historical medical mistrust emerged. 
As a Black person who just happens to be a doctor, I believe that is normal and important for Black and Indigenous people of color to be skeptical of the COVID-19 vaccine. Public health priorities and policy have shifted dramatically in the last year. Those motivations should be questioned. When I talk about the COVID vaccine with my patients, I tell them that even these extremes of being deprioritized and suddenly highly prioritized are completely congruent with corporate interests and racial capitalism. The United States priority is the economy. And now they've realized that it's far easier to have a booming economy when people are alive to spend their money and when they feel relatively safe and protected to do so. I don't trust the government, but I do trust the scientific development of the vaccine, which is why I chose to get vaccinated. Furthermore, conversations in the medical community about vaccine hesitancy dilute the reality of local and global vaccine apartheid. As doctors Uche and Oni Blackstock write in the Washington Post, racism is inherent in the COVID vaccine distribution. Black people must be explicitly prioritized for the vaccine. We need to bring the vaccine to the people and meet them where they are. Finally, we need a comprehensive public health information campaign to address concerns regarding the vaccine. We cannot ignore the impact of ableism, racism, and capitalism on the uncontrolled spread of the pandemic. We need to have honest, open dialogues that move beyond vague mentions of vaccine hesitancy. A country founded on white supremacy will never want Black and Indigenous people of color, disabled people, and chronically ill people to thrive. But me, I want that for all of us. And in her essay, The Pandemic is a Portal, author Arundhati Roy writes, whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought to the world a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Again, that last line. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Finally, I want to talk about anti-racism and abolition as praxis. I wanna start by uplifting the work of the UCSD Anti-Racism Coalition, which was founded by students at the School of Medicine. The ARC was born as a response to high profile executions of black people in the summer of 2020. The ARC is decrying reform as a solution to racism, is elevating anti-racism as a solution, and it is demanding transformational change and accountability from UCSD to the trainees, faculties, and patients the institution serves. Over the summer, the ARC issued a set of anti-racist demands to the School of Medicine and elevated demands made by URM residents and fellows to the hospital and program leadership. ARC's current efforts include removing police officers and Immigration and Customs Enforcement Officers, or ICE, from hospital and clinical environments. Follow and support their efforts. You can find them on social media or visit their website. Although the oppressive conditions within health and medicine can seem bleak, Mariam Kaba reminds us that hope is a discipline and we have to practice it every day. For me, there is a natural application of abolition and liberation to medicine. This graphic is from Interrupting Criminalization's Beyond Do No Harm webinar from October 2020. Its subtitle was Health Practitioners and Public Health Professions Recommit to Caring for People by Refusing to Participate in Criminalization. The graphic pictured is from Laura Chow Reeve at Radical Roadmaps. This webinar really underscored criminalization of reproductive and bodily autonomy and underlines 12 abolitionist principles for healthcare workers. We must practice hope as a discipline, imagine a better world, and work to build that world. <laughs>
I wanna close with this quote uh, from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She says, first, abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. Contemporary Persian abolitionists have made this argument for more than two decades. Abolition is not absence, it is presence. What the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. So those who feel in their gut deep anxiety that abolition means knock it all down, scorch the earth, and start something new, let that go. Abolition is building the future from the present in all of the ways we can. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that talk. I think that I just felt like a very, I don't know, humbling and powerful, powerful talk. And I would love to open this up for questions. And I also want to acknowledge that there were um, just a couple of comments that came in during during your talk. Um, one was, could you explain um, what a correction factor is? Um, this was before you got to um, your slides where you talked a little bit more about that, but maybe if we could just revisit that. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight a comment about um, thank you so much for talking about housing. This is so important. And um, one of your stories was very similar with Cancer Alley and uh, Gordon Plaza here in South Louisiana. Sure. Um, so thank you everyone for engaging and for the questions. Um, so regarding race for correction, or this uh, race correction is kind of a misnomer because it doesn't really correct anything. Uh, but essentially, um, so I think like for me, the biggest examples are um, with kidney function, this formula for calculating or estimating kidney function. And then uh, with the spirometry, having this idea of like a, a black correction factor. So for um, the race correction in kidney calculators, essentially just changes the formula a little bit. So this formula is, is four components, this like race, it's black, black or not black. Um, age, gender, and then like the cranium level, which is measured. Um, it's like a, a lab value that you measure. You put it into this calculator and depending on whether you select race as black or race as not black, it just outputs something different. So it's a very arbitrary thing, but it's built into these like medical calculators. It's built into our like lab reporting values. It's built into our uh, electronic medical records. Um, similar kind of race correction factor exists for um, measuring lung volumes with spirometry, um, wherein like black people are like corrected downward to have lower lung volumes. Thank you for that. You got lots of um, amazing talk, uh, fantastic talk. You want Thank to you. set it so that people can unmute? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, let me, let me try it again. I think we should be good. Did, did you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's lots of thank yous and awesome jobs coming in, um, Dr. Farrell. And then if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat and I'd happily relay those. Mm -hmm. And while we're waiting for people to maybe type in or kind of, oh, we have lots of hands actually. Never mind. I will save mine till till the end if there's time. Um, let's see. Uh, Julia went first. Maybe. Thanks. I really enjoyed that. I was actually just on most a follow up on what you just said. Do you think part? Uh, do you think those race corrections and asking about race on forms and having to input it into all of all of these aspects of medical care kind of reinforces for the doctors that there is something to it when there isn't. And do you think that might cause a reluctance to let go of, of that factor? Is there something that could replace race that would make doctors realize just how arbitrary that measure is in a way? Yeah, that's an excellent question because it absolutely does. Um, so, uh, like across the country in the last few years and, and probably more so in the last year or so, um, 
there have been a handful of institutions like Monty being one of them that have like removed the use of race in their like calculation, like take it out of like their EMR for uh, kidney function. Um, Dr. Vanessa Grubbs, who is a uh, kidney specialist in San Francisco, has been writing about the need to eradicate this race correction factor in renal function for many years. And um, they were recently able to do that at um, San Francisco General, but I, I, it was either at SF Gen and not at UCSF or the other way around. It was like, you know, half of your system corrects and the other one it has stopped doing that. Um, she's gotten a lot of um, pushback from it. And mostly, you know, of course, from physicians who are like, well, if we don't use black, like, what are we going to use? And, you know, this, this formula was based on like this idea of having more muscle mass. And so she's like, well, just estimate muscle mass. And then doctors are like, how do I estimate muscle mass? Like, how do I know what my patient's muscle mass is? And it's like the same, like, how do you know that someone's black or not? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's just so, so much of, so much racism is just ingrained in medicine and, and it, it's so hard to like get people out of that mindset. And even for like, you know, any of like the students and like trainees on the call can attest to the fact that, you know, Dr. Grubb's experience of getting this pushback is, is it's not, you know, it's not novel. Like anytime that, you know, I've brought up um, like health disparities or health inequities or racism in medicine, particularly throughout medical school, it was kind of like, oh, like, <laughs> like we're not going to, we're not going to talk about that. Like, we don't really want to touch that. And so there's an enormous reluctance, um, I think, among medical professionals and physicians and people in medical education just in general to really try to stop using racist medicine, which this is a problem. Um, it looks like um, I see Enrique. Hi, thank you for the talk that you gave. It was it was really great. Um, I had a question about, I guess, the future of medicine. I'm an urban planning student, which is why I was really grateful that you brought up housing because there's huge health implications for how we plan our cities uh, that happen on the population level. And when I think about medicine, my understanding is that physicians and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like physicians think of themselves as working on individual bodies. Like this individual body is having a problem in some way. And so I'm going to try to fix that problem. Uh, and it seems like there's a tension between that, I guess, foundational idea and medical practice and, um, the fact that inequity works on a population level, especially if you're talking about something like a freeway or where people's housing is located. Um, so I'm just, wondering how do you think that those two perspectives can be can be reconciled yeah that's a great question i i think that that's a really good point that like so much of medicine is like training to focus on like the individual and that's like very slowly changing and honestly that mindset is the reason that I decided to like get a public health degree because I was like, this isn't like, this really ain't doing it for me. Like, this is not how I understand like the reality of my life or the people around me. Um, I think as far as future directions, it's a little hard to tell. I, I certainly believe that there are a lot of people that are pushing for trained, like a lot of black medical students and black residents and black people like in medicine and non-Black people as well, who are like pushing for these changes. But, you know, with, with the exception of these like very small moments of like, you know, this acute anti-racism, you're, you're really pushing against a system that doesn't want to change um, because medicine just like wants to uphold the white supremacist status quo. Like that is the, the easiest thing, that is the default. And so that's what you're up against. Um, and, you know, is there hope for medicine? I feel about medicine in the way that exists now the same way I feel about the police where it's like this is not something you can reform because it's like roots are garbage <laughs> like it's just white supremacist garbage at the roots so you really have to build something different thank you I see Emma's hand up <laughs> 
Um, Emma, you're breaking up just a little bit. It's a little bit faint. We can, I'm hearing parts of what you're saying, but not, not everything. Sorry about that. No worries. Thanks, Emma. Uh, two questions. First, uh, why do you think that the Montefiore, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, please correct me, um, health system wouldn't uh, place one of its hospitals in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, given the health care need in the area? Um, so, I mean, I think if... <laughs> If this answer was about some of the hospitals that they're closing, I, I feel like my answer would be a little bit different. I think, um, uh, so right now, you know, like, so 40, 50 years, 60 years ago, whatever, um, the Lincoln was the only hospital in the South Bronx, but no, there's like a few other hospitals in the Bronx. Um, hard to say if they're, you know, meeting the, the needs of the population, but also like Monty doesn't even do a good job of meeting the needs of the population, so. Like, would the community want Monty there? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, other other uh, answer to the hospitals are closing is money. Um, and, you know, fuck poor people, but yeah. And Emma, did you have a follow-up question? Or a second question, sorry. Second, what is your take on the massive turnaround of the reaction of health systems being so interested in anti-racist behavior? Acute anti-racism. Um, I, I think that something that's like particularly salient is, um, so, you know, everybody decided that they were anti-racist, maybe probably didn't even really, is still probably don't really know what that means. Or what that looks like but also something that's been fascinating is the like very how very quickly people kind of revert to their like old racist ways um i'm thinking in particular of a recent um podcast episode it was like some jama pop podcast um on like the title was structural racism but it was like two white men talking about how like racism is like a, I don't really ever want to hear that word and like whatever I'm not racist because blah 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 um and one of the men in the podcast episode was the CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals um which is like the public health or public hospital system in New York City and I was just, you know, this podcast dropped like maybe within the last like four to six weeks. And I remember getting an email or seeing like a, a memo in December, January about how him at him as a CEO, like a letter that he like signed and put his face on it. Like I am like, we're still committed to anti-racism, like we know that like structural racism is blah, blah, blah. Like this is bad. Like we're really trying to like not be so racist. And then he kind of goes back and like does this typical racist thing on the podcast, which if it wasn't for people being outraged about like what nothing would have come of it. So I think that, you know, even a year later, um, a year from like the, the, the summer uprisings, um, less than a year even, I, I think that, you know, 
first people showed us who they were before all this happened, um, as did institutions and organizations. And so the likelihood that they've actually changed or actually learned like I am always very skeptical about it because it really is like long-term actions that are most telling so it's possible that you know the last year has really truly made an impact on people and people are really willing to be to commit to anti-racism in their daily lives and professional lives but a lot of that is inevitably lip service because you don't want to be caught saying the wrong thing when anti-racism is so popular now. So it looks like we're right at um, right at time and I want to respect everybody's time. But uh, if we could just please give a huge thank you to Dr. Farrell and a sort of round of virtual applause. And I would also like to, to thank our RISE interpreters, um, Phil, who was on earlier, and Amy, uh, who's been, been with us. Uh. All right. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks for coming. Thank you for interpreting. <laughs>